じゃあ,あの帝国になりましたので始めさせていただければと思います。Now it's 12 o'clock, so let's get started、uh, on time. As I mentioned, for those who are on the outside, if you're, you're more than welcome to sit with us. えー、と外側に座っている方々はぜひ別に一緒に中に座っていただいても全然結構でございますので、えー、ぜひインタクティブのディスカッションをできればと思います。えー、so I'll be the moderate,、uh, wait, I don't have, 私通訳しなくてもいいんですよ。I don't have to translate for myself, right? <laughs> okay, so、uh, um, from, for the benefit of my、um, <clears throat> non Japanese speakers, welcome to Kyoto and welcome to the Building Internet、uh, Resilient Infrastructure.、Um, Uh, session.、Uh, my name is Ken Katayama. I'll be、uh, moderating in my role as the KU University Global Research Institute、uh, role.、Um, my day job is I work for Toyota Motor Corporation. We're a mobility company, but today I'll be speaking in my role as KU University.、Um, this, this,、uh, thank you, Otsuka san, for giving me the opportunity to be able to moderate this session.、Uh, we'd like to keep this session on schedule. I've asked my speakers. To keep to eight minutes each,、uh, the Japanese delegation of Otsuka san and Moritsu san and Otani san will be speaking 15 minutes in total. And then Eric on my right will be speaking eight minutes, and then we have a speaker from Australia also doing eight minutes. So we want to provide also an opportunity for each of our speakers to be able to、uh, re comment on, on, on some of the other um, uh, things that they've heard, and also especially. Give the audience to, like Sugimoto san, an opportunity to comment. So, um, um, uh, so if, if I may, I'd、uh, Seth, are you ready to、um, speak? Well, if, well, while you're getting ready to uh, uh, speak, and are you online, Seth? Yes, I am. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Can everybody hear Seth? I guess you can, right? Seth, can you say something、yes. again? Good. Okay. So now. Yes. Hi, everyone. Great. Now, I think also we have to get your,、um, uh, what you call your slide on the screen. We can hear your voice. But, えっと、なんか最初のスピーカーのセスさんのスライドを多分上げなきゃいけないんですよね。So while we're waiting for Seth、um, to put get his slides up on the screen, again、uh, on my right here is Eric,、uh, Mr. Otsuka from the、uh, Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications is on my right. <laughs> and Otani san from KDDI is on my left, and Moritsu san from NTT is on my right over there. And so, do we have、uh, Seth's、um, slides up? I'm still trying to use some time. You said you can't move out to stem us. So, it doesn't seem like the slides are up. I'm still going to use some more time. The reason why I ask、um, my co- former colleague,、uh, Sugimoto san、uh, from NICT, Um, to, she, she's, do, do you know Sugimoto san? Yeah, yeah, she, she's really super, super sharp. And, and so she,、um, she used to work at、um, uh, NISC, which is our cybersecurity agency, and also she did uh, privacy uh, work at MIC、uh, before that as well, too. So I, I know that she's probably in the right position to make a comment、um, because we, we want to comment. So, ne, yo i s t o i t e ne. So, Seth, まだ上がんないんです。いいんですかこれはい。<laughs> okay, so Seth, why don't you just get start talking and we'll figure out the slides as we go along, please? Sure. Sure. And you、Sounds、haven't. Good. Okay. All right.、Uh, good afternoon, everyone.、Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to、uh, participate in this discussion. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person with all of you in Kyoto,、um, but very happy to、uh, have the opportunity to participate virtually. My name is Seth Ayers. I lead、um, a business line in the World Bank that focuses on the nexus between digital technologies and climate change. And、uh, for the, the presentation today, I'll talk a, bit, a bit about how we think about、uh, these issues, the overlapping issues of. Digital and climate change and resilient infrastructure, in particular, as part of addressing、uh, the connectivity challenges that、uh, we're facing globally. And I see it looks like my first、uh, slide, at least the cover slide, is up. And actually, if you could please go to the next slide. I wanted to begin、uh, the presentation just by 
giving a bit of context um, with a couple of key um, statistics on issues uh, about climate change uh, that many people may be aware of. Um, certainly climate change is impacting uh, all countries globally, but for developing countries, the impact is far greater. And estimates that uh, up to 130 million people will be pushed into poverty uh, who currently are not in poverty. So they're above the poverty line at the moment, but because of these severe weather events, whether it's flooding or droughts are gonna be pushed um, into uh, a poverty situation. And then we're going to also, the predictions are for massive migration patterns. So <clears throat> significant changes to people's economic and social um, situations as a result of climate change. This, uh, these challenges are particularly acute for small island developing states um, for reasons that many people would likely be aware because of their low-lying nature. Uh, they're particularly susceptible to a number of severe events, such as uh, rising sea levels and intensified um, uh, cyclones and hurricanes and storm events. And on the, the positive side, um, the work that we've done has identified that if you do make an investment into making your uh, digital infrastructure or any sort of infrastructure in general more resilient, that there's a massive benefit for doing so. For every dollar that's invested into making infrastructure more resi resilient, you actually get a $4 return. So significant um, upside to making your infrastructure more resilient. Next slide, please. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to flag was that um, many developing countries are recognizing the significant potential that digital technologies. So when we talk about digital technologies, it's telecom infrastructure, uh, data infrastructure, uh, as well as being able to use these technologies through digital skills. So developing countries are recognizing that digital technologies are gonna be fundamental to both um, uh, addressing our climate challenges, as well as making sure that countries are able to adapt to these new uh, dynamics. And so here's just, uh, we did a review of the national determined contributions um, of developing countries. And you can see on the mitigation side that uh, nearly 50% of the countries look at digital technologies as a key driver. And in the case of adaptation, so helping countries uh, adopt to uh, climate change, nearly 75% of countries are putting digital technologies as a key driver. Next slide, please. So if we recognize that digital technologies are critical to tackling climate change and that we know we need to make this infrastructure more resilient. What are some of the, the challenges uh, that we face in building this infrastructure uh, globally? So as we went through the pandemic and we were reliant on doing more virtual activities um, in countries in which digital technologies existed, they were able to deliver uh, services to their citizens at a rate of three times. They were able to get services to three times the number of individuals than countries that did not have these digital technologies. So whether you're dealing with um, a pandemic or a severe climate event, having, having digital infrastructure is essential for service delivery. Yet there's about 3 billion people globally who do not have access to the internet. So about a third of the world's population is not online. So that's a huge challenge is if we recognize the power of digital, both for not just uh, ensuring service delivery and helping people adapt to climate change, but also as a tool for helping high emitting sectors such as transport and energy reduce emissions, we've got to address this connectivity gap and to do so in a, in a sustainable and green way. Next slide, please. Okay, so at the World Bank, we're tackling this issue on two fronts. We have what we call 
greening digital. So ways in which we look at the sector itself. And this is, I'm gonna dive a bit deeper into some of the work that we do here on resilient infrastructure. So when we talk about greening uh, digital, it's greening the, the infrastructure, digital infrastructure, both from a resilient standpoint uh, on the adaptation side, and then also from a mitigation uh, perspective. So uh, the digital sector emits about the same amount of GHG um, emissions as the airline industry. So it's somewhere between 1.5 to 4% of global emissions come from the digital sector. So it's not a nominal amount. So it is important also, as we talk about resilience today, also to see the sector as also a generator of GHG and how to tackle that issue as well. And then the other piece that we look at is greening with digital. And this is ways in which digital technology can help countries adapt to climate change, develop new tools, early warning systems, et cetera, that can make countries be better prepared uh, to climate events. And then also to use digital technologies to reduce emissions in other key uh, sectors, such as energy, transport, agriculture, these sectors that are very high emitters, how can digital technologies help to reduce those emissions? Next slide, please. Uh, and one more minute, Seth, one more minute, thank you. Okay, so I'll go through, actually, uh, if I could go to the to the next slide. Or... All right, so, and actually, let me, I'll jump into the country example to Kenya, please. Next slide. This was just identifying some of the issues that uh, telecom infrastructure uh, faces which are amplified as a result of climate change. So next slide, please. Okay, very good. So in the case of Kenya, um, so Kenya has quite good uh, telecom coverage. Nearly 100% of the population has some sort of uh, connectivity to the mobile network, and it has a decent uh, fiber network as well. It is particularly susceptible to floods and storms, and you can see from these pictures uh, how it was impacted um, in 2022 as well as in 2023. Next slide. Okay, and then so what we've been doing with the Kenyan government is using GIS uh, to be able to map all of the mobile network sites, um, particularly the base stations, and to overlay that data using flood uh, prediction and to be able to then determine which base stations are likely to be impacted or could be impacted by floods, and then to be able to make assessments on uh, what <clears throat> the potential cost could be in order to then make um, adjustments and to improve the resiliency of that mobile infrastructure. Next slide, please. All right, and so then not just looking at at the country level, but uh, uh, more broadly, uh, this gives you a sense of at different stages of the telecom infrastructure, whether it's looking at international connectivity and submarine cables, steps that can be taken in order to reduce the potential threat uh, or risk um, of climate events on this infrastructure. And this is where redundancy comes into particular play. And then next slide, and I'll wrap up. This just shows you a bit more on the, the details with the uh, other uh, aspects of the telecom um, infrastructure, but maybe uh, four quick things to wrap up on that developing countries are particularly vulnerable to climate change and severe weather events. So resiliency is key for telecom infrastructure as a driver for economic and social development. Two, there's a high return on investment, $1 of in resilient infrastructure investments returns $4. There's generally uneven implementation. Urban areas, high populated areas tend to have better resilient infrastructure, but more work needs to be done on rural areas. And in order to do this well, you need to do proper risk assessments and then make sure that redundancy and diversification are part of your plans going forward. Thank you very much. All right, th thank you, Seth. I mean, again, I'll give you time uh, afterwards also to reiterate some of your points, but I appreciate the global view as well as the explanation on Kenya. So from Kenya, uh, we'd like to go to Japan uh, for our three speakers uh, from Japan, starting with uh, Mr. Otsuka uh, from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Otsuka-san, five minutes, please. 
Thank you, Katayama san, for allowing my intervention. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Yasuhiro Otsuka of the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Uh, I'm in charge of policies related to today's topic of how to uh, make uh, how to deal with increasing risk of natural disasters and keeping our people connected. So now let me start my presentation. Uh, Seth-san just explained an increasing risks caused by climate change and Japan is a country prone to such disasters. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now let, oh, sorry. Earthquakes and typhoons are typical examples of natural disasters that affect telecommunication services in Japan. About 20% of earthquakes with magnitude six or greater occur around Japan. Later, Morita-san of NTT will explain the impacts of the Great East Japan earthquake of nine, uh, 2011 on communication services and the efforts to recover from the damage. The typhoon may be related to presentation of Eric-san later, but typhoons often cause heavy rain, flooding, and landslides, and have huge impacts on communication service in Japan as well. Here is a uh, next slide, please. Here is an example of Typhoon uh, Faksai, what we call by number in Japanese, number 15 in September 2019. Very strong winds with a maximum instantaneous velocity of more than 50 meters per second caused collapse of power transmission towers and utility poles and triggered large scale power outages of up to 930,000 households in Tokyo metropolitan area and around. Restoration of power took a long time, and as a result, many mobile base stations ran out of batteries and stopped operation. During the worst period of damage, as shown in the map, more than 2,000 base stations of mobile operators combined stopped operation, mainly in Chiba Prefecture, east of Tokyo. Uh, next slide, please. Our, as our daily lives and economic activities depend much more on uh, uh, communication services, the demand for continuous provision of communication service is getting even higher. The MIC, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, is working closely with operators to ensure stable provision of the communication services. The role of MIC is to set the frameworks to realize resilient networks, and the operators are expecting, expected to build and operate resilient networks based on such frameworks. As you can see in the dotted line, let me explain three examples of such frameworks. Uh, next slide, please. The first example to set uh, technical, uh, the first example is to set technical requirements of networks in the form of regulations or guidelines. In the event of Typhoon Faxai, in 2019, which I mentioned earlier, prolonged power outages caused many mobile base stations to suspend their operations. In respect, the MIC revised the technical standards and stipulated that major base stations should be able to operate for a longer period. Specifically, as shown in the slide, base stations covering local government offices are required to satisfy operation time of 24 hours or longer and uh, uh, base stations uh, covering uh, prefectural offices are recommended to satisfy operation time of 72 hours or longer. Based on the standards, now uh, 9,000 mobile base stations satisfy operation time of 24 hours or longer nationwide. And in addition, some 4,000 mobile power supply vehicles and portable generators are deployed for, uh, nationwide. Uh, one more minute. <laughs> And uh, next slide, please. The second example, collaboration of related parties that includes MIC operators as a government agencies and local municipalities and as a public utility operators are essential to uh, deal with natural disasters. The so MIC set up platforms to such collaborations. Collaborations on electricity power, uh, fuel, and cooperation on restoration of obstacles blocking roads are being implemented. For example, with information on the prospect of power restoration, communication operators can manage their mobile power supply vehicles more effectively to avoid suspension of operation. 
the final, uh, the next slide, please. This is a final slide of my presentation. Uh, studies are being conducted at the MIC to realize intercarrier roaming in the event of mu uh, natural disasters and network problems. It is expected that users of carrier A who have stopped operation will be rescued by the network of another carrier B. Study is underway to realize intercarrier roaming by the end of 2025. I explained uh, three examples of the role of MIC to set frameworks to realize resilient networks. Now I will give the uh, floor to Morita-san of NTT and uh, Otani-san of KDDI. Uh, they will present their activities in the past and at the present to make their network resilient as well as to uh, recover from the damages uh, promptly. Thank you for your attention. For Thank you, Otsuka-san. So, Morita-san and Otani-san will be speaking in Japanese. So, for this, あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
はい、ではここからはですね我々の災害対応力の強化に向けた取り組みについてご紹介をさせていただきます次のスライドお願いします、はい、まず通信ビルそのものですね通信ビルの設置の状況を確認しまして津波の影響が予測されるエリアまた洪水が予測されるエリアについては通信ビルそのものをですね高台の方に移設するとそういった取り組みを実施してきております次のスライドお願いしますあと,あと1分ですね、はい、同様に通信ケーブルもですね津波の影響が予測されるエリアについては内陸に移設をしたりですとか橋の下をすぐ通っていたケーブルについては洪水によって橋が流されてしまいますので川の下にですね管路を新設しまして迂回をするとそういった取り組みを実施しています次のスライドお願いしますまたさまざまなドローンもですね活用しております大小さまざまなドローンを活用しまして大型のものはあの牽引ケーブルの付設ですとか上空からの調査また小型なものは橋の下側ですとか人が入れないようなそういった場所の調査に活用をしてございます次のスライドお願いしますまたさまざまなツールも活用しております左側はですね気象予測のデータなんですけれどもあの事前に気象予測をしまして被災が予測されるエリアに対しては人員を戦後的に配置しまして被災後の早期復旧で右側はですね通信ビルの電力の状況ですねこちらを一元的に監視をしましてあの効率的な復旧計画の策定に活用をしてまいりました、はい、では次のスライドお願いしますはい、こちら最後のスライドなんですけれども災害対応の訓練についてです我々はですね日々あの機上でのシミュレーションですとか実験を用いた災害対応の訓練また自衛隊と共同の訓練等を行いまして有事の際にも早期に復旧できるよう日々訓練に努めてございますあのこれまでご説明してまいりました通りですねあの有事の際にもお客様の通信をいかに維持していくかまた早期に復旧してさせるために我々ですねいろんな努力をして日々工夫をして行動をしておりますはい私からはあの以上になりますありがとうございます、はい、森田さんありがとうございます具体的な取り組みありがとうございますじゃあ次大谷さんお願いいたしますハロー uh, This is、uh, Tomo Otani、uh, from KDDI Corporations Let me、uh, share with you、uh, KDDI's、uh, activity、uh, in the case of disasters Please go, to, please go to the next slide. Okay. So,、uh, in, in order to、uh, prepare for the disaster and、uh, monitoring,、uh, assess、uh, network environment, we have、uh, prepared for network operations center locally and globally. In terms of、uh, local operation in Japan, we have、uh, 20 12 network centers、uh, all over the Japan.、Uh, main uh, center is Tokyo. In Tokyo and Osaka, it's a、uh, dual uh, operations for uh, re uh, resiliencies. In the case of、uh, global operation, we have uh, Tokyo, uh, uh, Asian part, and the、uh, European part、uh, taking、uh, advantage of、uh, time difference、uh, from day,、uh, day to day. And today,、uh, we would like to introduce uh, our uh, uh, recovery、uh, mechanism for,、uh, in the case of disaster uh, to uh, pinpoint、uh, to handle the situation and、uh, let people、uh, on site.、Uh, We are equipped with a very brand new IT, IT gears、uh, from, the, from the point of、uh, I, ICT uh, uh, sense. And this is the disaster recovery tool,、uh, which indicates how we as,、uh, monitor、uh, current situation and how we assign.、Uh, The people to fix、uh, the network、uh, failures. And, and also, we have a, a dashboard for disaster countermeasures,、uh, correcting, correcting from、uh, various data. And we, we can easily assign、uh, people to on site,、uh, considering the current situation of the affected、uh, environment. And also, we have、uh, disaster management systems uh, depend, uh, based on big data in, as well. 
we collected a bunch of data uh, from uh, network resource, network uh, equipment, traffic, uh, operators, and uh, so forth. And we can easily uh, understand what what is going on and what will go go on uh, in, in the environment. And also, uh, operator on site uh, will utilize uh, uh, smartphone and uh, like iPad types of gear. But uh, uh, in, in the case of disaster, uh, the communication uh, service is also out of services. So uh, when before uh, going to to the the site, they download various information uh, to the devices and uh, they can still utilize the information uh, even on site uh, where the telecommunication service is no more uh, available. One more minute, please. Okay. And also we uh, have a drone uh, to monitor uh, remotely. We, we can uh, get the information 2D, 3D, even uh, movies, so we can effectively uh, manage, uh, uh, understand uh, what, what happened uh, in, in the areas. And we can uh, send the people to uh, fix uh, the network failure from land, sky, <laughs> sea, as well as uh, space. Recently, uh, we introduced uh, Starlink, uh, a brand new uh, technology, uh, even in the case of disasters. So, so uh, this is a new information. And lastly, uh, we uh, keep uh, training ourselves uh, with thanks to uh, other uh, public sectors and uh, municipals uh, uh, locally, even uh, internal. So we, we hope uh, we can provide a relief from connection and make you smile. This is the end. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Otani-san. Thank you. Let me give the um, uh, clicker to Eric. Um, so Eric from Philippines, thank you. All right. Uh, konnichiwa, everyone. My name is Eric Santiago from PLDT Smart. So before I press start, just wanted to ask um, if you're familiar about the Philippines having 7,100 seven islands, and that depends if it's high tide or low tide. So aside from that, as you know, uh, we are also a typhoon-prone country. There is approximately 20 typhoons entering our area of responsibility every year. So by just saying that, it is crucial, it is critical for us to have resiliency embedded in the design of our network. And because of that, I just wanted to share one of this award. So SMART is the wireless arm of PLDT. It's the, PLDT is the uh, Philippines leading integrated telco company. So this was in MWC where we were awarded by UCLA as the Philippines fastest and best mobile network. Having best mobile network um, includes the not only the coverage, but especially the resiliency of the network during the time of calamity. We are doing numerous things to optimize it with energy efficient solutions to enhance, to further enhance customer experience and also to promote sustainability. So we have deployed a lot of solar powered sites to be able to reduce power consumption and also help the environment. We have accelerated our rollout, not only on the macro sites or outdoor sites, but also on in-building to further enhance our services. But one thing to note is really the disaster resilience. Um, we have been uh, supporting the United Nations Office Humanitarian Affairs uh, um, mandate on how to support uh, subscribers, especially during time of disasters. By doing so, we have promoted some of these products, uh, particularly the emergency cell broadcast system. This is the first one that we deployed first in the Philippines 
to ensure that we will provide uh, uh, promptly alerts to all the subscribers prior to any disasters. We have been uh, providing some of this smart satellite, just like uh, my colleagues here. They also, we also provide um, resiliency through satellite backhaul during time of calamity, especially when the terrestrial sites are damaged or not functional. Um, we are we are we have provided a lot of text broadcasting and a lot of uh, uh, support during time of calamities in that way uh, it is important for us that during and after the time of the disaster we will be providing some hotlines smartphones sim cards and all of those uh, free communication access to our subscri subscribers we have recently deployed this and it's very became very popular. It's a one-stop emergency comms kit that will include a solar panel, smartphone, satellite phone, a Wi-Fi, a megaphone, a wheel cell, a flashlight, and a lot of uh, emergency comms training. This one here really saved a lot of lives. Uh, aside from that, maging laging handa is always, it, it's a Tagalog word for, uh, for always being prepared. So, mm -hmm. We have caravan teaching around the nation on how to be able to be prepared in times of calamities and what's the first thing to do. As I mentioned, I just wanted to reiterate, building a resilient network is embedded in our design. We have transport network not only uh, within the Philippines, but also submarine cables that we have resiliency. So in time of fiber cuts that we will have other routes to be able to continuously provide connectivity. We are expanding them to almost 1.1 kilometers right now uh, of, uh, of a fiber network. Um, and our emergency operations center is always ready to be able to provide services during time of calamity. Uh, the last one that, that we got hit uh, uh, by the super typhoon Rhine in December 2021. It was around Christmas time where we have deployed a lot of, uh, uh, of our supports by air, by land, and by sea just to be able to, to provide connection during that time. With that said, I would like to uh, highlight this one. This is an outstanding award from our um, um, National Response Science Cluster highlighting that PLDT Smart has truly been a partner during time of disaster by utilizing a resilient network that no Filipino will be left behind during this time. And uh, with that said, I also would like to show you this video to summarize everything that I said. Thank you.
thank you so much for the opportunity to present and share with you some of the initiatives we're doing to deliver that resilient network to our fellow Filipinos in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Very nice video as well, too. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think we have D Dr. Kornozeski on online. Uh, hello. And I, hello. Uh, yes. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. Well, welcome from Australia. Um, I believe we were not able to do our pre-briefing today, Dr. Kornozeski. I was asking um, the uh, speakers, uh, Seth from the World Bank and uh, Eric from the Philippines, and yourself for eight minutes each. Um, and then to provide an opportunity for the audience and also some of the speakers to recomment as well. So if I could ask you kindly to wrap up by about um, 12.48 our time, 12.49. 12 I think I, if you're in Australia, I guess that's about um, 2.48. 2 so I, I, I give the floor to you, Dr. Konovsky. Thank you. Great. Oh, okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, there we go. Is that working? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for having me here at the forum today. All right. In the interest of time, I'll get started. As in many parts of the world, Australia has experienced its fair share of extreme weather events in recent years. And uh, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology has noted in recent reports that uh, this warming is likely to continue. Uh, the effects of this warming in particular were demonstrated during the Australia 2019-2020 summer, when large parts of the country were severely affected by bushfires. These bushfires resulted in tens of millions of hectares of land being destroyed, destruction of thousands of properties, Tragically, 33 lives were lost as well, um, including the death or displacement of an estimated 3 billion animals. Since then, a succession of La Nina weather events has caused significant flooding, impacting many communities across Australia over 2022. And the flooding has affected the everyday lives of many Australians, with many parts of the country, such as Sydney, experiencing its wettest year on record. Um, I'll just quickly go through these slides. So obviously everyone in the room is aware of the impact of telecommunications um, from these disasters such as fires and floods. And um, I'm sure everyone in the room is also um, well aware of the impacts on communities. So in the interest of time, we'll just pass through. Before I cover the key actions that the Australian government is taking to improve the resilience of telecommunications against disasters, I thought I'd just provide a general overview as to what the government's role is when it comes to telecommunications disaster resiliency. So under Australia's federal government structure, the Australian government is responsible for telecommunications. This includes responsibility for managing policy and regulatory settings for the sector, as well as providing grant funding to encourage certain activities, such as expanding mobile coverage in regional and remote areas. However, in Australia, it's our state and territory governments, of which there are eight, that are primarily responsible for responding to disasters. Australia's telecommunications carriers are likewise responsible for the direct operation and maintenance of their networks. This means that when a disaster occurs, telecommunications companies will typically work directly with the relevant state or territory government in accordance with the emergency management arrangements within that jurisdiction. The Australian government's main role in this context is therefore to help prepare the sector to respond and assist with recovery from disasters. Now, this is just a general overview and in practice, the state and territory governments will often work with the sector um, to help prepare them for disasters, such as by involving them in emergency planning. Likewise, the Australian government more broadly provides assistance to telecommunications companies on occasion when it's necessary. So, for example, the image up on the screen there um, is during a severe flooding event that impacted the northwest coast in January 2023, where floodwaters destroyed a major arterial bridge, which contained um, fibre optic cables. This caused major outages. And in response, assistance was provided by the Australian government in the form of a military uh, aircraft to be able to get those technicians across the, um, across the bridge. 
So in terms of what the Australian government has been doing to help prepare the sector for disasters, there are a range of actions that have been taken. Uh, recognising the serious impact of the 2019-2020 bushfires on Australia's telecommunications network, the government has been implementing resiliency improvement initiatives through four core measures, which I'll go through now. The first is the mobile network hardening program round two, which is delivering around 1,000 mobile network resiliency upgrade projects across regional and remote Australia. So stage one provided $13.2 million to upgrade battery backup power to a minimum of 12 hours at 467 base stations. Stage two provided $10.9 million for 536 resiliency upgrades. Over 461 of these upgrades have been completed so far, and they've included the installation of permanent power generators, increased battery reserves, transmission resiliency upgrades to protect against outages, and site hardening measures such as protective ember screening to protect sites from the potential impact of embers, radiation or flames. The second element is the Sky Master Satellite Deployment Program. So this program has installed fixed satellite internet connections at over a thousand evacuation centres and emergency service depots across Australia. This provides free backup connectivity via satellite. While many of these facilities already had fixed line connections, this way um, we can keep our emergency personnel connected and focused on the emergency response. The third element is the Temporary Infrastructure Deployment Program, which is expanding the availability of portable assets such as cells on wheels and portable satellite kits, which, have, uh, which provide temporary coverage following a disaster. The final element is our Communications Program, which has been involved in developing communications material and other resources for stakeholders to use in an effort to improve general community awareness and preparedness um, for outages during disasters. Um, all of these projects have had a real impact in improving the availability of telecommunications during natural disasters to date. And simple messages can help communities and tourists prepare and know how to get information and get help such as um, our radio broadcasting services. For example, during the March 2022 floods, temporary facilities were able to be deployed to evacuation centres in flood affected areas across the state of New South Wales, which provided critical connectivity for evacuated residents in their time of need. Um, uh, another example of this was during major flooding in the state of Victoria when the communities of Bem River and Marlow were isolated both geographically and in their connectivity, with both communities being able to access the internet um, through satellite services which were installed in the months prior. So while these examples have made a material difference, it is clear from more recent disasters that the threat posed is ongoing and that more needs to be done to improve the readiness of Australia's telecommunications infrastructure. In acknowledgement of this, the Australian Government recently announced the Better Connectivity Plan for Regional and Rural Australia last year. The plan forms part of the Australian Government's telecommunications agenda and is providing more than 1.1 billion to Australian, oh sorry, to rural and regional communities in Australia. The plan includes $656 million over five years to improve mobile broadband connectivity and resilience in rural and regional Australia. And as part of this, the Better Connectivity Plan includes $100 million in funding for additional measures aimed at further strengthening resilience against um, natural disasters. One more minute, please. Thank you. Um, so um, of that $100 million, there's two programs that are included in that. So the first one here is our mobile network hardening program, round two. Um, and our second one is the telecommunications disaster resilience innovation program. Um, and if anyone would like any more information on um, either of those two initiatives, um, my contact details are up there on the screen. And thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you had 30 more seconds, I think, uh, Dr. Kuniski, <laughs> I appreciate you wrapping up, but thank you so much. Well, I appreciate um, all of my speakers uh, keeping uh, to time. Um, as promised, I, I left 10 minutes uh, for questions, also maybe some for some follow-up. Um, I do recognize, um, as for, since Tara and Seth are online, um, in the audience, I have some colleagues, um, Ms. Sugimoto, she's from the NIC National Institute for Communications and Technology, as well as Dr. 
uh, Komiyama, he's from JP Cert. Um, um, you know, they, they'll probably have good questions and comments, but um, before I point out, out them, uh, Seth, uh, do you have something that you wanted to add um, that you weren't able to cover in your presentation? I'm good. I think um, I was able to uh, cover everything as needed and, and look forward to the questions. Great, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Otsuka-san, uh, is there ありがとうございます。あの、日本語であの、私もあの、質問お待ちしたいと思います。ありがとうございます。よろしくです。エレクさん、何か質問がありますか。あ、私も大丈夫です。あの、貴重な機会いただきましてありがとうございます。よろし
Yeah, so it's the the it's often referred to as the Lifeline report. So if you put in Lifeline reports World Bank, it should uh, pop up uh, in your search engine. Is just a quick follow up. Is this yeah. uh, the similar data that's being used by folks like NetBlocks to calculate uh, particular regional shutdowns or, or internet blackouts and how they would affect the eco economic uh, situation on the ground? Um, I don't know if you know NetBlocks, but NetBlocks.org, they're, they're using a lot of open source data, but I didn't know if, if some of it was coming from the World Bank. Yeah, so it's a very good question. I'm not sure of those details. Um, the map that I showed for Kenya is based on open source data. Uh, so we do do a lot of work in country with um, open, open source applications um, in data in order to do some of the evaluations. I'm not sure specifically on that uh, piece of it, but we do publish most of our data is available online at data.worldbank.org. Thank you, Eric. All right, well, thanks for the question. So educating our uh, constituent is a continuous journey, but I'll let me divide it into three segments, right? Number one, online learning. So we are developing um, uh, short videos to clearly showcase how and, and what to do during time of disaster. And we distribute that one in, it's through, through our uh, channels online, our websites, and, and, uh, and via text messages. Second item is really uh, we use caravans to go to specific areas to do face-to-face -face learning, right? Because some, some people are not that tech savvy that you need to really show it to them and demonstrate. And that's very powerful. And the third one is really informing the youth of today, of, of in our country to ensure, to encourage and teach their, their, their grandmas, grandparents, and, uh, and, and, and parents in, 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 their, in, their, uh, in their family. In that way, it will be a continuous learning to everybody. Thank you. So are you satisfied with the two answers? Is that okay? Oh, you do? Okay, well, all right. You, if you do, well, okay, can I, I, I'm, I work for a company which is important called Just In Time. So uh, there's two more minutes left, and, and so if, if there's no, <laughs> what I took it out of this. <laughs> so um, if I could ask you to keep your question within two minutes, so please, I'll give you the microphone if that's okay to, to you. Is there a microphone over there? Please, if you can pass the mic. So if we could quickly identify yourself. And uh, uh, Oh, no, no, I'm from okay, Kazakhstan. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Arman Andresilov. I'm from Kazakhstan. And I just uh, want a question from the Jap Japanese group. Uh, I'd like to know the current situation. I, I mean, uh, in common situation, the percent of coverage of Japan and uh, average speed of internet uh, for common time. Because your your presentation was was about emergency time, and but I don't know about common time. Okay. Have any problems in common time with internet? Coverage to, to speed and internet to speed. I see the question. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your questions. Um, um, uh, we, we are not sure the exact number uh, of the, the percentage of coverage and uh, the average uh, speed of uh, internet access, since uh, there are a difference uh, between mobile and uh, fixed uh, services. And also even between 4G and 5G, uh, there are service uh, quality difference. Currently, uh, Japanese operators are eager to construct 5G network uh, world, uh, Japanese uh, nationwide. I believe uh, recently more than 90% uh, availability uh, uh, in terms of 5G, and I believe, but uh, please visit uh, uh, MIC we website to find the uh, exact numbers and uh, in terms of uh, 4G, we believe that 
1990 point something. <laughs> But uh, the number is really、uh, fluctuate depending on the time and the day and the year. So please confirm the website.、Oh, okay, thank you. So you have no problem with residence in the common time. So, so maybe if we can use that question after the session, I'm going to stop now. Thank you. So thank you, Otani, for answering. So it's one o'clock, as promised. We are finishing on time.、Um, Seth and Tara, thank you very much for participating from overseas. Um, and thank you, and、uh, thank you, everybody, for. Kaijo no mina san mo ko san ka ita 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 ita. So if we can give all of us、uh, a, a hand of applause for participation, thank you. Thank you. Arigatou gozaimashita.